Okay, welcome back ladies and gentlemen. This is part two of the plants one and I warn you it's going to be a little bit of a long one. So there are basically three plant tissue systems. The above ground parts of the plant, which are called shoots collectively, consist of stems, leaves, and flowers with internal pipelines for conduction. Stems are frameworks for upright growth and display of flowers. Photosynthetic cells in leaves are exposed to light, and flowers are displayed to pollinators. The plant's descending parts, or the roots, usually grow below ground. They absorb water and minerals from soil and conduct them upward, and they store food. They also anchor and support the plant. Plants also consist of three basic tissue types, the ground tissue, vascular tissue, and dermal tissue. The ground tissue system makes up the bulk of the plant's body. The vascular tissue system contains two kinds of conductive tissues that distribute water and solutes throughout the plant's body. And the dermal tissue system covers and protects the plant's surfaces. All plant tissues originate from meristems, localized regions of self-perpetuating embryonic cells. Apical meristems happen at the tips of roots and shoots, and ground meristems help to grow laterally. Apical meristems at the tips of roots and stems is responsible for growth and elongation. Descendants of some of these cells will, will develop into specialized tissues of the elongating root and stem. Growth originating at the root and shoot tips is labeled primary growth. The lateral meristem tissues are responsible for the increase in diameter of older roots and stems. Lateral meristem growth is referred to as secondary growth. There are two categories of plant tissues. There are simple tissues and complex tissues. Simple tissues are made up of only one type of cell. Parenchyma is the softest. It doesn't have thick cell walls and it has a very soft, smooth texture. When you bite into a banana, that's parenchyma tissue. It's very soft and squishy. Colenchyma tissue has fiber cells inside of it and colenchyma tissue is what produces the strings that you find in celery. Sclerenchyma tissue is the hardest, and it contains sclerids, or stone cells, within it. This gives the tissue a gritty feeling, and you feel that on your tongue when you eat a pear. Parenchyma makes up most of the soft, moist, primary growth of plants. Its thin-walled, pliable cells stay alive and retain the cap capacity to divide. Various types of parenchyma participate in photosynthesis and they form the mesophyll. They also participate in storage, secretion, and other tasks. Its cells are metabolically active at maturity and retain the capacity to divide, as in wound healing for a plant. Colenchyma cells are thickened and help to strengthen the plant, for example the strings in celery. It's commonly arranged at strands or cylinders beneath the dermal tissue of the stems and stalks. The primary cell walls of colenchyma become thickened with cellulose and pectin at maturity, often at their corners. Sclerenchyma cells provide mechanical support and protection in mature plants. The secondary walls are thick and often impregnated with lignin, which strengthens and waterproofs the cell walls. Sclerenchyma cells from fibers such as in hemp and flax, um, others are called sclerids, and they form strong coats around seeds, as in a peach pit. Complex tissues compo are composed of a mix of cell types. Vascular tissues function in the distribution of substances throughout the plant, and dermal tissue systems, called the epidermis, covers all the primary plant parts. Xylem is one of the vascular tissues and it uses two kinds of cells, both of which are dead at maturity, 
to conduct water and miner minerals absorbed from the soil. Vessel members are shorter cells joined end to end to form a vessel with perforation plates at the end of each member. Tracheids are long cells with tapered overlapping ends. Phloem transports sugars and other solutes throughout the plant body. Phloem contains living conducting cells, called sieve tube members, that bear clusters of pores in the walls through which the cytoplasm of adjacent cells is connected. Companion cells, adjacent to the sieve tube members, helps to load the sugars produced in the leaves and unload them in storage and growth regions. A dermal tissue system called the epidermis covers all the primary plant parts. It has a waxy cuticle that covers the external surfaces of the plant to restrict water loss and resist microbial attack. The periderm replaces the epidermis when roots and stems increase in diameter and become woody. And stomata openings between pairs of guard cells permit water and gas exchange with the air. Within the shoots, it has a primary structure, and inside that stem, you have a vascular bundle, which is a multi-stranded cord of primary xylem and phloem, running lengthwise through the ground tissue or shoots. The arrangement of vascular bundles is genetically different in dicots and monocots. The stems of most dicots have vascular bundles arranged as a ring that divides the ground tissue into the outer cortex and inner pith. In most monocots, though, the vascular bundles are scattered throughout the ground tissue. This scattering of the ground tissue allows it to bend and sway without breaking. It's not brittle. Leaves have many structural and functional variations. Most have a thin, flat blade which is attached to the stem by means of a stalk or petiole. Leaves of some trees wither and drop away from the stems, which means that they're deciduous as winter approaches. Others can be evergreen. Leaves are adapted to local environmental conditions and can orient themselves for maximum exposure to the sun for photosynthesis. Leaves of most species offer a high surface area to volume ratio. The epidermis of a leaf covers all leaf surfaces that were exposed to the surroundings. Its surface may be smooth or covered with a variety of hairs or scales. The cuticle on the epidermis is that waxy layer that minimizes water loss, and stomata are located mostly on the lower epidermis. Mesophyll is a photosynthetic ground tissue found inside leaves. Photosynthetic parenchyma cells in the mesophyll layer are located between the extensive surfaces of the upper and lower epidermis. Air spaces participate in gas exchange for photosynthesis, and columnar parenchyma cells attached to the upper epidermis, called palisade cells, have more chloroplasts than the spongy cells below. Veins are the leaf's vascular bundles. Veins, or vascular bundles, form a network for water, solutes, and photosynthetic products. In dicots, the veins repeatedly branch into smaller ones embedded in the mesophyll. In monocots, veins are quite similar in length and run parallel to the leaf's long axis. So by looking at these two micrographs, you can tell that the monocot leaf is the one on the right and the dicot leaf is the one on the left. The internal st structure of the roots is quite complex. The root structural organization is laid out in its seed. The primary root pokes through the seed's coat first. It always produces the root first before the shoot. Cells in the apical meristem divide and then differentiate into root epidermis, ground tissues, and vascular tissues behind the meristematic region. The root cap protects the apical meristem and pushes through the soil. Cells are torn loose as the root grows and end up as debris next to it. The root epidermis, with its extension called root hairs, provides an extensive outer absorptive interface with the soil. 
the root hairs increase the surface area of that root and so therefore increase the rate of absorption. Vascular tissues form a vascular cylinder arranged as a central column of primary xylem and phloem inside a layer called the pericycle, which is outlined here in red and yellow. You can also see that pericycle as the little delineating line as the inner circle within a carrot when you cut it widthwise. In most dicots, the primary root emerges from the seedling, increases in diameter, and grows downward in a taproot system. Lateral roots will emerge sideways along its length, for example, in a carrot. The primary root plus lateral roots form the taproot. In monocots, though, the taproot is replaced by adventitious roots that arise from the stem. These roots and their lateral branches form a fibrous root system. Fibrous roots are short-lived and occur in most monocots like grasses. So here's an example between lateral roots and root hairs. You can see that the root hairs down at the bottom on the diagram on the right are much smaller and they are extensions of just the epidermis. The lateral root actually comes through the pericycle before it extends outward outside of the root. When you have secondary growth, remember this is produced by the lateral meristems, and so you can have primary xylem in the center and secondary outside of that lateral meristem. The vascular cambium in this, root, in this tree um, stalk picture is actually the la vascular or the lateral meristem. So what it's doing is it's producing new cork layers toward the outside. It's also producing secondary xylem toward the inside. The primary xylem does not change because that is the stuff that developed with the beginning root. Woody stems and roots have selective advantage since they can grow taller to intercept more energy from the sun. With the extra energy, they can form large root and shoot systems that make them more competitive in gaining resources, thus making them more successful producers. When we form bark, periderm, periderm, which is formed from the cork cambium, plus the secondary phloem, make up the bark. Bark consists of living cells and dead tissues outside the vascular cambium. Okay, so remember that I just said secondary phloem is underneath the bark. The flo secondary phloem is how the plant gets the ma vast majority of its nutrients distributed around the plant. So if you girdle a tree, in other words, take the bark off down to the vascular cambium all the way around, that means you've completely cut off the upper and lower parts of the tree from feeding itself. So therefore the tree will die. Heartwood lies at the center of older stems and roots. It's a depository for resins, oils, gums, and tannins, and so heartwood can be extremely important for things like oils, like sandalwood oil. Heartwood makes the tree strong and able to defy gravity. The sapwood, though, is the secondary growth located between the heartwood and the vascular cambium. It tends to be wet, pale in color, and not as strong. It is, however, rich in the sugar-rich fluid of the phloem. For example, that's the part that you tap into for maple trees to get the sap out. In regions with cool winters or dry spells, the vascular cambium is inactive during part of the year. So early wood, which is the start of the growing season, contains xylem with large diameters and thin walls because there's more water to transport. Late wood contains xylem with very small diameters and very thick walls. Growth rings appear as alternating light bands of early wood and dark bands of late wood. Water moves through roots and stems and then to leaves. Some water is used for growth and metabolism, but most evaporates into the air by a process called transpiration. Water moves through pipelines called xylem, 
composed of cells which are all dead at maturity, called tracheids and vessel members. First, the drying power of air causes transpiration, which puts the water in the xylem in a state of tension, leading from the leaves to the stems to the roots. Second, unbroken fluid columns of water show cohesion, which is aided by the hydrogen bonds of water. They resist rupturing as they are pulled upward under tension. Finally, as long as water molecules escape from the plant, tension inside the xylem permits more molecules to be pulled up from the roots to replace them. Phloem is a vascular tissue with organized arrays of conducting tubes, fibers, and parenchyma cells. Sieve tube members are alive at maturity and are interconnected from the leaf to the root. Companion cells also participate in a supportive role. Storage forms of organic molecules, for example starches, fats, and proteins, are not easily transported throughout the plant body, so therefore they're converted to a much more soluble form, such as sucrose, in order to be transported by the phloem. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the lecture on plant parts and their functions. We're going to go into how they reproduce and their responses to their environment in the next lecture. Have a good day.